Welcome to Mutual Information. My name is DJ. In this video, I'm going to show you what I think is the best approach to learning about probability distributions. I'll start with an analogy. Let's say you had a full minute to memorize this mess. After that minute, you have to redraw it from memory perfectly. Every edge, every node, no mistakes. You think you could do it? Well, if you have a normal human brain like me, then no, there are just too many details to get wrong. But what if I were to tell you about the pattern behind this complexity? That is, there are 25 nodes, which could be numbered like this, and you should consider only nodes that are not prime. Then draw an edge between any two of them, but only if their difference is prime. Now I'll ask again, could you redraw this pattern knowing this fact? I mean, yeah, almost certainly. It might be tedious and annoying, so please don't do it. But yes, it could easily be done all from memory. The lesson here is, if you want to hold something big and complicated in your head, it's best to find a simple compressed pattern that explains all or most of that complexity and then learn only that pattern. Then when it's time to produce that complexity, just reapply that pattern. Now, this lesson isn't always easily applied. How to explain a complicated thing with a simple set of rules isn't typically obvious or possible. Fortunately, it happens quite frequently in mathematics and in this case, statistics. So to state it directly, my argument is, if you want to understand a bunch of probability distributions, it's best to focus on the stories that relate them rather than their individual definitions. Now, because the world of probability distributions, their properties and their relationships is huge, the compressed pattern that relates them is still quite big. Compression helps, but to own such a huge, valuable bag of information, you still must pay with focus, time, and patience. And if you're curious about this graphic, mourn it at the end. But for now, I'll start by telling you one of these stories that relates six of these distributions. We'll start with the simplest of random variables, the Bernoulli. One sample of this guy yields one of two outcomes, either yellow or blue. It has only one parameter, the probability of a blue box, which I'm writing here as P, and I've chosen specifically to be 0.3. Now, let's measure these boxes to produce another random variable. Specifically, let's draw lines above each blue box and count the yellow boxes between them. The punchline is this list of numbers would have a geometric distribution and it carries the same parameterization as our Bernoulli, which is that number P. Not too bad so far. Next, let's apply a different criteria for those lines. Let's draw one over every other blue box and count the yellow boxes between those. Well, that would give us the negative binomial distribution with its R parameter equal to two. If we picked every third blue box, the R parameter would be three. All right, still not too bad. Let's try another. Let's draw lines separating groups of six boxes and count the blue boxes between those. Well, that would give us the binomial distribution with its N parameter equal to six. Hopefully you're getting a sense for how these distributions are similar. They're all measuring the same thing, but with a different criteria for counting. So let's step it up a bit. Let's try to make a continuous version of these boxes. One way to do that is divide the probability of a blue box by some large positive number C and make each box count for one over C instead of one. As you can probably guess, I'd like you to pretend this number C approaches infinity, but to keep things tame on screen, I'll go with C equal to five. With that, let's reapply our previous criteria and see what we get. If we were to sum the boxes between all blue boxes, keeping in mind that each box now counts for one over C, then those numbers would be exponentially distributed. The rate parameter in this case would be P. I should note, the rate parameter is not P over C, which in the limit would be zero, but rather it's P, the probability of a blue box in the discrete case we just came from. Moving on. If you were to sum the boxes between every other blue box, then you would get a gamma distribution with the shape parameter equal to two and the scale parameter equal to one over P. As you can see, the gamma distribution can be viewed as a continuous version and in fact, a generalization of the negative binomial. All right, last one. If you were to count the blue boxes between each block, which sums to six, then you'd have a Poisson distribution with a rate parameter equal to 6P. Who saw that coming? Okay, let's take a step back. 
My argument is, if you want to understand these six distributions, you should focus on this short story. It's just good bang for your buck. It tells you a lot and it's not that hard to remember. In fact, I think I could cram it into this corner. That said, I still need to follow through on my analogy. Reasoning about this story should yield patterns that would otherwise feel like extra free-floating flashcards needed to be memorized. The first pattern is virtually announced in this story, and that is the discrete continuous analogies. The exponential is the continuous version of the geometric. The gamma is the continuous version of the negative binomial, and the Poisson is the continuous version of the binomial. Also, I'm putting the Poisson in the continuous section because it measures continuous things. With that said, these analogies are useful. In my experience, continuous distributions can be hard to reason about. Their parameters just aren't interpretable, so we can reason with their discrete versions in their place. For example, I think of the exponential distribution as a geometric distribution with thin boxes. That's useful when trying to remember things like the mean of the exponential. The mean of the geometric is easy, it's 1 over p. Meaning if a blue box shows up 10% of the time, then on average I have to observe 10 boxes before I see my first blue box. Okay, what about the exponential? Well, by analogy, it must also be 1 over p, or after you do the parameter translation, 1 over lambda. See how this can be helpful? And clearly, this sort of moment translation doesn't stop with the mean of the exponential, though that may be the simplest one. The next pattern to notice is the summation relationships. That is, if you sum samples of the geometric, you get the negative binomial. And by analogy, if you sum up the exponential, you get the gamma. To see that, let's revisit those separating lines of the geometric. Now, if you wanted to show the sum of two geometrics with this view, how might you do that? Well, since we know the geometric is just the number of yellow boxes between lines, we could drop every other line and then count between the remaining lines. But notice, these are exactly the same separating lines of the negative binomial, with r equal to 2. So we see, summing up geometrics gives us a negative binomial. And by analogy, the same argument shows that the gamma is a sum of exponentials. Now that is insight. And in fact, you could use a similar argument to show that summing up binomials yields another binomial. And the same is true for Poisson. It would be pretty easy to figure out their parameters too. And if you smuggled in the central limit theorem, that tells you why four of these distributions approach the normal distribution as some select parameters become large. More insight. So hopefully that convinces you. It's easier to understand the crowd of distributions if you remember the stories that relate them rather than their individual definitions. And that's because those stories offer additional properties virtually for free. And those crystallize the whole picture and burn it into your brain. But, as you may have noticed, that hardly covers everything. Well, yes, the compression ratio, at least from what I can see, isn't as dramatic as we may hope. There is some fragmentation of stories, each of which only relates a handful of distributions. Still, those are worth remembering. That said, to demonstrate some of the range of these stories, I'd like to quickly fire off a few of my favorites, just as a bonus. Ready? I'm about to throw a lot at you. Okay, say v is just some fixed positive number, and you have a gamma distribution with both its parameters set to half of v. Then you sample from that gamma some value which I'll call zi. Then you use 1 over zi as the variance in a mean zero normal distribution. And then you sample a value from that which I'll call wi. Well, if you repeated that process many times, you discover that wi has a student t distribution with v degrees of freedom. I'm not sure why, but it was only when I learned that fact that I start to get comfortable with the student t distribution. The student t is just a bunch of normal distributions mixed together with different variances that bounce around according to an inverse gamma distribution. Okay, another. Let's say we have an exponential distribution with some fixed lambda parameter. We'll draw two samples from that exponential, zi and zj, and take their difference and call that difference wk. Well, in this case, wk would have a Laplace distribution. If you don't know about the Laplace, it shows up a lot in machine learning for generating sparse solutions. And again, I felt it was pretty unintuitive until I saw this angle. Okay, last one. Let's say we sample two values from the standard normal distribution, again, which we'll call zi and zj. Then let's say wk is their ratio. Well, in this case, wk has a Cauchy distribution. Excuse my redundancy, but again, this demystified the Cauchy distribution for me a lot. The Cauchy distribution is weird. 
It has an undefined mean and variance, which I felt made no sense. But it made a little sense after I realized it's a ratio and the denominator has an expected value of zero. Okay, now I kind of get it. Now, everything I've told you remains a small piece of the full story. A much bigger view is given by this epic graph, which I did not and could not create. In fact, it took many contributors to put this piece together. They even have a website dedicated to it, which I'll link to in the description along with my other sources. If you take my recommendations, which is to learn these stories of relation, then exploring this graph is a great place to start. And finally, thank you for your focus. If you enjoyed this video and would like to continue learning about statistics and machine learning, please like and subscribe. Content like this is the content I'll continue to make, especially if I can get your support.